Welcome to the Raising Values Podcast, where the traditional family talks. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You can support the Raising Values Podcast through Patreon. Phil and Gillian are behind the mic, and we hope you enjoy the show. Welcome back to Raising Values. I have the camera like way off today for some reason. Why didn't we do a camera check? We did a mic check. Just saying. Hello. Good morning. I love you. She always asked me why we didn't do a camera check when we both know that I was ready to do a camera check way before you got here. Anyway. So... We, okay, we're, we weren't ready for the, like, go time. I don't think we were ready for the go time. Uh, to be fair, we were out late last night, and it's daylight savings time, so there's, like, there's multiple reasons to be off kilter this morning. <laughs> yes, I guess so. Yeah. I was up all night coughing, too, so, anyway. I woke, I woke up at 7 a.m. for absolutely no conceivable reason, just an hour before my alarm was supposed to go off, and I'm doom, awake. Yeah, no fun there. Um, anyway, so some business to get out of the way. Of course, you have your Women Who Prep conference. That's next month. And I think that's it. I don't think there's anything else that we have to really promote I right mean, now. just the usual reminder of Prepper Camps in September, if that's, if that's the thing you're into. And, uh, you know, if you are, prepper damp, PrepperCamp.com is where you should go look for information. <laughs> At this point, like, you're going to have a hard time finding your way into the campground itself, but there's hotels and Airbnbs and other options in the area. So. Yeah, I'm really not in the frame today. I'll just come sit over here. How's that? That's, that's fine. Okay. Well, today's episode, we are talking about setting boundaries in relationships. As my wife sets her elbow in my lap. To that get is my boundary. You don't have boundaries with me. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, you do. I know. <laughs> anyway, um, recommended topic from uh, uh, your sister, which is awesome. I think we've kind of talked about setting boundaries before, and I feel like I always talk about the boundaries that I've been setting for myself. But boundaries are super important, and there's a variety of ways to work that into any conversation. And I think for, you know, the title says relationships. I think you can... We probably need to expound on that a little bit, you, setting boundaries for all sorts of interactions with different people. You know, I was thinking this morning, doctors, you set your boundaries for your doctor um, and what you would, what? Well, I, I take relationships as a, I guess, more open definition than just like boyfriend, girlfriend, spouses. Like relationship is just a relationship with anybody, like with your doctor. You're, it's going to be one of those mornings, isn't it? Yes. Great. <laughs> Great. Hopefully. Oh, good morning, Joe. I'm glad you're here so that you can... Witness my murder. I wasn't going to say that. Um, I was going to say so that you can um, enlighten us with what you would have to say as well. Being enlightened today by this guy. Um, yeah, so setting boundaries in relationships. So I've been doing this a lot. In the last couple of years of setting boundaries for myself, mainly just because of my mental health. And uh, it is becoming easier and easier for me to set those boundaries. I have always been a people pleaser. I've always uh -huh. been a, um, what is the role of someone? You might hear our cat. I think, I think she has a UTI. And so she's going a little cuckoo bananas. <laughs> but anyway, right now she's trying to wake up Piper. Um, and she's very upset that we're at this table for some reason. But anyway, um, I've always been a people pleaser. And I've always been the um, the person... The peacemaker. Peacemaker. I've always been the peacemaker, which is... I don't know if there are any other peacemakers that listen to this show. It's a hard role. And I... I, I I am naturally the peacemaker because I am an empath and because I don't like confrontation. And so I'm trying to make sure everybody's happy. And I'm trying to make sure we're all on the same page and we're not mad at each other and there's no confrontation happening. And unfortunately, that's just, that's just who I am. I don't like confrontation. That being said, I have gotten a lot better about setting boundaries because 
Gillian, prior to boundaries, would let anyone and everyone run over her. And I still do. I still do to an extent. Um, There are some family members that I have to fight the guilt to allow... No, that's not what I'm trying to say. I have to fight the guilt of setting those boundaries with those people, but still maintaining a relationship with them. Because the relationship that I have with... uh, There's one person in mind, two people in mind, actually, in my family, who's has boundaries. I have set boundaries for those people, but, um, I still will be, um, I I still will be a caretaker and I will still be there to help and still allow myself to be in that relationship with them on my terms, sort of in a way, kind of. Sometimes my terms aren't going to be my terms because of health reasons, but Anyway, I, um, yeah, so these last few years, I think since I was probably, I would say 37, 38, I don't know what is going on with this cat. (laughs) She's nuts. 37, 38, I started to really look at my mental health and I started to really stop being concerned about what other people were doing or saying or living their life or how I, I really started to look at how I fit into their life. And, um, and then what kind of stress did that bring to me? And I am a big talker, especially on this show about energy and energy given and energy received and, you know, all of that stuff. And I've really started to like, dive down into my witchiness and and figure out where my energies are coming from. And so as an empath, I'm picking up a, a lot of things. I'm always picking up other people's energies. And I had this like aha moment <clears throat> probably, well, around August, September, maybe October, I had this aha moment of there's certain people when I get around them that I just feel so nervous and anxious and like I stumble over my words and I can't, I, I, I'm not that person that I usually am. I'm not that like bubbly, whatever. I just like shrink into myself. And it just, that aha moment of, hang on a second, this person makes me feel the same way when I'm around this person. And I started thinking about that because there's this one person that I work with that makes me think of a family member of mine. And I'm trying to not like I gotcha. say too many names or whatever or relationships. And this one person over here, we'll call her left person, and the right person is who I work with. Left person over here makes me feel a certain way because of some trauma throughout my life that she has created. And... And the amount of stress induced by this person. We're still talking about left person. Um, And then this person over here on the right was cut from the same cloth. Same energy. Same energy. And from what I can gather, from what I've learned from different sources, has the same life almost that person left on the left does too like treats her family the same way treats um her kids and grandkids and you know all that stuff it's all it's all very much a mirror and it was almost like I remember sitting in my classroom going oh my god that's what it is I'm picking up on her energy and I'm always nervous and always like scrunch in on myself around this person because she makes me feel the exact same way when I'm around this other person. And then it was like, wait a second. Maybe it's not me. Maybe it's not, I'm not feeling stress for myself. Or maybe it is both. Maybe I'm feeling the stress from those energies. But I'm also feeling their stress and their energies. Okay, I just said the same thing, but I meant it two different ways. I'm feeling their energies and it's making me stressed out. But I'm also feeling their stress. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm, I'm feeding you the rope. I'm following. Okay. So 
I'm getting stressed from two different ways. Yes. Mine and theirs. Yeah. Okay. So boundaries. So I have set boundaries with left person. I can only set, I mean, I can set boundaries with right person. Um, luckily, I don't see this person a whole lot because I'm always in my classroom. But anyway. But that is a boundary. Like yeah. reduce a reduction. <laughs> Closing <of> my door. <laughs> reduction of proximity. <coughs> I can tell you, though. My relationship, my interactions, I shouldn't say relationship because I'm, I'm, yes, I have a relationship with this person because we work together, but my interactions with her have um, been different ever since that aha moment Mm -hmm. because I'm now thinking whenever I see her or I have to interact with her, this isn't me. This energy, this nervousness, this anxiety that I'm feeling, this is yours. This isn't mine. This is yours. And so it's kind of given me a little boost of confidence and... I, I'm a I'm a little bit more in control of being able to control myself. Does that make sense? Am yeah. I making sense today? Uh, to me, at least. Okay. But I, I don't am, know if I'm I making am, sense to. <laughs> I am fluent in Gillian at this point. So. <laughs> That's true. Good morning, Nina. Glad you're here. Yeah. So to give to give a a polar opposite to that. Okay. I've never been a people pleaser. Like no, you have never been a people pleaser. Um, I wouldn't say I was always, I would say that my failing when I was younger was not the inability to establish boundaries, but the fact that I didn't know how to be in a relationship. I didn't know how to be in a relationship with proportionate boundaries, if that makes sense. In other words, like if a person made me uncomfortable, they're out. Mm -hmm. That relationship is over. I'm casting them out of my life. Because that person, like, I didn't know how to stay in a relationship and, and enforce boundaries. In other words, if you if you pushed my boundaries, you were out. And there was, there was not going to be a situation where I was going to stay in that relationship and have you continue to test my boundaries. It was, no, you're testing my boundaries, you're out. Yeah, I've, I've seen you end a couple of relationships with people just because they, they crossed a line. There was no give or take. There was just a, you're done. Yeah. Now, I would say that I've... I've gotten a little bit better about that over the years, only because like I'm still I'm, s- I'm still extremely picky and choosy about who I allow kind of into my inner circle. I, but I feel like it has tears now. Like there, yeah. I'm, I'm willing to have I'm willing to be friendly but casual to people with the understanding in my head that like you're you're at like the first the first circle you're never going to get past that because you and I just don't haven't built that relationship for me to allow you further in. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who are like all the way to my inner circle because we have that relationship. We have that history. We have that mutual respect for each other that I feel comfortable letting them that far in. But that is that tiered system is something that did not exist for me when I was younger. It was binary. Mm -hmm. It was you're all the way in or you're all the way out. I have noticed in, you know, so next, no, actually next week we will have been married 16 years, but we've been together for 20 years. In those 20 years, I have noticed your level of forgiveness for people. And maybe it's not forgiveness. You're certainly, you certainly don't forget what people do oh, no, or never. have done, but you do have, I, I have seen. I move past it maybe. So is it not forgiveness? I don't know how to answer that question when it comes when it which is slightly off topic but only a little bit but like not really because that's a boundary yeah I think like for forgiving me, people for me whether or not I don't know how to I don't know what word to use for it I can I can move past a person doing me wrong but I'm never gonna forget it and there will be no contrition from that wrong until it's been asked for and that by itself eliminates most most reconciliation between me and other people because most people are too proud or too stupid to ask for forgiveness. <coughs> and my point of view is, and a lot of it goes back to how I was raised, but like if you wrong a person, I don't want to say it's like ritualistic or ceremonial, but there is like a reasonable expectation that you're going to apologize for that injury and ask that person's forgiveness. And when a person has come to you and humbled themselves and asked for that forgiveness, it's kind of on you as an adult to give it to them. You know what I'm saying? Like that person asked that they admit they, they hurt me. They asked for forgiveness. If I continue to hold it overhead now, I'm in the wrong. So my problem 
has always been that knowing that most people are not going to ask for that forgiveness and try to mend that relationship, I can just say, I can just kind of like stick it in a box and say, I'm never going to get that apology, but that means this relationship is going to end because I'm not, it's never yeah. going to get back to a state where I'm comfortable being in it again because that person wronged me and they're never, it's not even the, the, the apology necessary necessarily, but it's the apology that gives me some hope. I'm not going to get hurt again. But if you don't apologize for it, then you're not admitting you did wrong. And if you're not admitting you did wrong, how can I ever expect you're not going to do it again? Right. I do see that. I absolutely do see that. I I have a couple of, maybe a few, and like, I feel like they're ongoing because some sometimes, in some capacity or another, these people are still in my life. Um, and I don't see that changing in the near future anytime soon. But for instance, there's this one person, again, I'm not calling out names, who... I know who you are out there in listener land. You don't even know who I'm about to talk about, (laughs) but you will. You will. I, so, um, the last month, I would say, maybe, maybe not so much a month, but the last month has been a a little difficult at, um, for our family. We still covet your prayers, of course. Things are still moving along in that department, but, um... Because of where I live, I am going to be the person responsible for some things. And I was telling um, another person yesterday that I'm I'm not going to receive the help that I feel should be given in this scenario just simply because... I don't think they're able, and it's not like monetarily able, I'm not talking about that, or um, physically able. I think mentally, emotionally, they are not able to commit to helping me out in, in a certain way, in an aspect that I need them to help in. And that's fine. And what I was telling this other person was, you know, she was saying it really makes her upset and she's, um, you know, she's, she's watching from the sidelines and it's really just upsetting to see me having to go through this and da da da. And I'm like, I'm not mad about it because I know who this person is. I know how she is. I know what I'm going to get from her and I can't be mad. I'm not going to waste my energy trying to force her to do something that's just not going to happen. And then if it does happen, then it's it's going to be fighting tooth and nail, you know, more energy spent on something where I would have just rather not go down that road. Is this kind of like the frog and the scorpion without the malice? Where, like the, where you, the scorpion rides the frog's back? And then stings the frog, and then the frog says, why would you sting me? And the scorpion says, because I'm a scorpion. It's like, you can't get mad at a person for being who they are. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I guess I've never heard that one. You never have heard that, that parable? Not the frog and the scorpion. So the short version goes that there's a frog and a scorpion on one side of a bank, and the scorpion asks the frog if he can take him to the other side I've of the heard, bank. I've heard the concept. I guess the animals were different. Okay, may have been. But the, the short version of the, the short preamble or parable is halfway across the scorpion stings the frog and the frog says why did you do that now we're both going to drown and the scorpion says because i'm a scorpion it's just a parable to say that like if you let a scorpion on your back and he stings you you can't get mad at him because he's a scorpion and you knew he was a scorpion before you let him on your back and got halfway across the river well yes so that is what that is how i feel with this one um you know, one relationship that I have, this person is just not ever going to commit to anything that I'm going to need them to commit to. So why waste my energy on trying to get them to commit? It's just not going to happen. Um, But then as far as what you were saying for the apology, something that we've always told Piper, um, and I, I told my dad this the other day, and he wrote it down, and I was really surprised because, you know, like we talked about in past episodes, um, I... My parents used to be on a pedestal for me. They were the smartest, the, the the best, the everything. They were just the parents. They were my parents. And so 
and my dad is like tested genius and but and love my dad to death he's super super smart he has no common sense which seems to be you you either give up common sense for brains or you get a little of both and you know you know what that feels like phil yeah do you know a, how that feels well you know do you know that brain when, when and then god, when god distributes the common sense and the intelligence he has to give the rest of the men a chance by not giving everybody both <laughs> I mean, you have a little bit of common sense. But... I got a little more common sense than <laughs> than you give me credit for. I'm joking. Maybe not the social graces. But anyway, I told him, and this is something we've always raised Piper to say, or what we've always said to Piper is, an apology is no good unless there's changed behavior. Mm-hmm. So, you know, because she, she used to say, oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, for whatever reason. Maybe she was in trouble or she got caught doing something or whatever. And she'd say, I'm sorry. But the behavior would continue. And so we started to tell her behaviors. I mean, it's you have to have changed behavior in order for your apology to mean anything to us. Mm-hmm. Well, I started to apply that to everyone, not just as a lesson to my child, but why am I not holding adults accountable for that as well? Which is and an so, excellent question. And so I would be... Um, <laughs> I would get these apologies, and I've gotten some recently. And um, they're they're words. They are they're either spoken words, or they're in a text, or they're whatever. Um, Sheldon's from Big Bang are real people. Oh oh, super Sheldon's smart, super no smart, common no sense. common sense. They are real people. I live with one. I was raised by one. Yes, there there have been times where Gillian has asked me a question and I have answered it, and I have, the look on her face immediately tells me she was trying to make a joke or she was asking a rhetorical question. And she was not asking a five minute. She was not asking for a five minute explanation of like, you know, trigonometry or whatever. <laughs> no, most times I have to preface or preface or however you want to say it, um, a question that I'm going to ask Phil with. I need a short answer. Just give me the short answer. Short answer is usually two to three minutes instead of five to ten. And then I'm walking into the kitchen and I'm making dinner and it's like, oh, we're still talking about this. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm listening. I'm listening. Um, Sometimes the short answer you get is, I have no idea, babe. (laughs) I don't get that very often because I feel like as soon as I ask it, you are there typing something on the phone. Like you're researching the answer if you don't know the answer. But anyway, off topic. So... I have, um, I've gotten some apologies throughout my years, of course. Everyone has. I would hope that everyone has had apologies throughout their years. But when I started to hold adults accountable for their apologies, and I started to look at past behaviors, and I started to look at patterns in behavior with friends and family members, and then this apology would come along because my feelings were hurt or whatever, and then the gaslighting and then all that other stuff. We won't even get to that. But <clears throat> I I know that even though there's this long apology, um, the behavior is not going to change because the pattern leading up to it is still there because the scorpion is still a scorpion the scorpion is still a scorpion and so i immediately because i am now getting better at creating boundaries i immediately cut off the relationship because i don't have time for it i don't have time for fake friends or fake family or whatever because you can have toxic family members and you don't have to have a relationship with toxic family members. You can cut off that relationship in, in, in various ways or create boundaries for those people. Um, same as you would do for a friend or an old friendship. So what has happened with me and what I think setting boundaries does is you start to um, see yourself in a new light. You start to um, Think of yourself a little higher, like you deserve a little bit more than what those people are giving you. And, you know, you see those people give others those things. And why am I not on that list? Mm -hmm. I'm just as deserving to be on that list. And then maybe the answer just simply is because they will never see you like that. And to them, you will not be that person. And that's fine. I don't need it in my life. 
I don't need it in my life. And so boundaries are set. And boundaries could be a simple unfollow from Facebook or Instagram or a block on a phone or it could be um, whatever. My boundary was I'm not even going to respond because responding is not going to be fruitful in any way. You know, the 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 apology came with a bunch of gaslighting and a bunch of um, this was your fault and you should have done this and yeah. why didn't you do that and blah, blah, blah. And so me defending myself was only going to further that. It was only going to give more than that. Because had I said, hey, look, you really hurt my feelings kind of thing, and then they acknowledged that, then that would have been different. Maybe we were down a road where they were um, willing and able to listen to something that they did wrong. But the response, in response to you hurt my feelings, was nothing it was no acknowledgement of what they did. It was everything how I did something wrong. Um, and so that was when I decided, mm, we're done because I don't need that in my life. I already have so much other crap going on in my life where my energy is actually needed and my energy is deserving and those people see that it's deserving. And so I get, I get the energy received that I'm giving out, I don't need that in, in, anymore in my life. And so I am I am okay at this point in my life cutting off friendships or cutting off relationships with family members. I'm okay with that. Or if not cutting them off completely, at least making <coughs> them more superficial, more limited. Definitely superficial and limited. Definitely limited. Yes, definitely yeah. limited. And limited in not just how often I interact with them, but limited in what information they receive. Yeah. That it doesn't mean, you know, I, I tell my sister this all the time because she has this one person who she feels like she continues to need to have in her life. And that's fine because I feel the same way about this person. <clears throat> but when this person calls and is fishing for information, what I've told my sister, and because this is what I do, is... Everything is fine. The kids are fine. My husband's fine. Work is fine. School is fine. Everything's great. Nobody's sick. Everybody's great. Everything's great. There's nothing There's bad no drama. to report. There's no drama to live off of because that's what that person lives off of is drama. And so I don't feed into it. I don't feed them the, the things that they need to either go gossip or, you know, text their friends about me or my family or whatever. I don't feed into it anymore. And so everything's fine. And most often, if you ask me, anybody, everything's great. No, we're good. And I'm not going to share information with a lot of people. That's the other boundary that I've created for myself is you don't get to know everything about me. And we talked about this on the social media episode last week. I still post to social media. I will still say things. I will still post pictures and do all, all sorts of interactions on social media. But I will not... I will be the first to, to admit that what you see on social media isn't at all everything in our life. Not even a tenth. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I, would, I would say that, you know, based on this conversation, I see boundaries to two directions. First is you're placing a boundary upon yourself, like what you're willing to put into the relationship. And the other is... You're placing a boundary, like a filter, to to restrict what's able to come into the relationship. You know, like the relationship is just it's it's a two it's like a it's a two way hey street, and you can you have to be able to place boundaries on both ends to say, based on who this person is or the way they treat us, there's certain things I'm not willing to allow in, and there's certain behaviors I'm not willing to permit to be brought in in towards me. Mm -hmm. Like I and I feel like that sometimes that's where the difficulty comes in is understanding that I feel like the difficulty is twofold. I think it's very difficult, especially it was for you for a long time to place that boundary and enforce it where people's behavior towards you you didn't think was appropriate, made you uncomfortable, made you feel bad, but you didn't know how to like stand firm on that boundary and say no, I am not going to be treated this way. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I feel like you also had a problem with setting that boundary and saying, like, 
I'm I'm going to limit your like you are demanding X amount of my attention. I'm only going to give you this much mm -hmm. because I, I don't know if I want to use the word. They're not worth more than that, but they're not deserving <coughs> of that kind of behavior. I think deserving is a better yeah. maybe and worth. I mean, why not say worth? Deserving and worth. You could use those to, to say the same thing. Sometimes it has a different connotation. Some people use the word. So. They're worth something and they get their feelings hurt. And I, I don't draw distinctions between that. But then again, I don't. I don't let my emotions get tied yeah, up a lot of my decision making. I don't feel like deserving and worth have <clears throat> very different things. Because I was told by someone who I considered a friend for my birthday that it, there was something going on with my birthday. And um, her response to coming was, it's it's not worth it. You're not worth it. And, and we're not going. And it kind of hurt my heart a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I did come home and cry because yeah. I was like, what? Somebody, I mean, it wasn't even through actions of saying I'm not worth it. You know, like, in I feel like the text message I received from someone else, even though it was a long whatever, all it really said was, you're not worth this. You're not worth me accepting an apology or giving you an apology. You're not worth that. But I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you whatever this is. But this person came flat out and said, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I was like... Do you know what you're saying? Like, you know what you just said to me? I don't think I don't think they fully thought through the ramifications of what they were saying when they said it. Probably not, but but you know the other the other side of this equation is that if you're in the position like I am, where setting boundaries kind of comes naturally and easily, and I would say in most cases, like I'm I am per emotionally at peace and have no guilt about setting a boundary on a relationship mm -hmm. because I I have always believed that. A relationship is, I mean, first of all, it, it's not compulsory. You're not under, at least the way I grew up, like, you're not under any obligation to be in a relationship with anybody. Right. And unfortunately, sometimes that includes family members. It's like, yeah. we're always going to be family. I don't wish ill upon you, but I don't have to ever speak to you again for the rest of my life if you treat me poorly. See, Which is a well, different, it's a difference between you and I, because I've... Yeah, I was about to say, I was raised a little bit different. Well, Family's family. You're supposed to be there for your family, and you're supposed to allow, you know, access to all family members to but yourself. On the, but on the flip side of things, I... Okay. So, part of, I think part of... I don't want to say the disconnect, but part of like part of my rationale comes from the fact that like the way I was raised was that once I got married and once I had children, you two became my family. Like my parents are always going to be my parents. My extended family will always be my extended family, but my my family, that core group, it only includes three people now. Four if you include the furry little terrorists we live in, we live with. But there's only three people in this family. So the three people that I have to have a relationship are the woman I married and the child I, that I helped create. And that's it. Everybody else is optional at this point. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like very harsh. And I think that my parents wouldn't take it as being harsh because... I don't you know, think my, your parents would. Well, my, but my probably fa watching. My father's one that instilled that in me. But it's the idea that like the family that you create is your responsibility and they're the ones you have to be the closest to because you are responsible for them. Right. So all that being said is whatever is best for my family, which sometimes means cutting, cutting off contact with people that are hurtful to us or mistreat us. That is what has to happen. So if I have to cut off contact with somebody because they're just, they're not good for to be around my child, that's the way it is. It's Joe, not. Joe has a question for you. <clears throat> so when my daughter gets married, she's going to be in a very similar position that I am now, as far as I'm concerned. Like I will always be her father. I will always be on the other side of a phone call or the other side of a whatever if she needs me. If her husband needs me, if her kids need me, if she has kids, if she had, gets married, who knows? I will always be her father. But I also expect her to hold her husband closer to her heart than me because I'm her father. That's her husband. That's her other half. Mm -hmm. And when she has children, I expect her to hold, to do right by those kids before she ever does right by you and me. We're adults. Yes. We're responsible for ourselves. That is the family she has chosen and created. And that is ultimately what should be closer in her heart. 
Now, I'm not going to take that personally. I would take it personally if the opposite happened and she married a man, but then daddy came first in her life. Because at that point, I'd be like, well, hold on a second. <laughs> That's not the way this <laughs> is supposed would be to like, work. Hang on. Let me tell you about my life with your mother when we first got married. <laughs> Well, but that was because also because that's how I was. But that was also something now talking about setting boundaries. Mm-hmm. And I would say boundaries and expectations kind of go hand in hand. But when we first got together, like, yeah, that was something I made ex- I made vividly apparent to you. You mm-hmm. are going to have to deal with the cat. She's having a she's having a morning. <laughs> but like, not happy. That was something I made very apparent to you very early on. Was this is how I was raised? This is my expectation of marriage. And mm-hmm. if you if you want me to commit to this marriage, <coughs> it has to be this way. And that was never I never put that on you like to strong arm you or to like I don't I don't oh, like no. to use the word ultimatum, but it was really just me trying to very, very honestly express to you there's certain things in this marriage that have to be this way because if they're not, this marriage is not gonna work. Monogamy, loyalty, so on. So, you know, like pretty basic stuff. But it was still the fact that if the marriage is not this way, I cannot comfortably be in this. No. So if you if you came to me today and said like you want to become a swinger or something crazy, I'd be like that's a that's that's going to be a hard no for me because that's just not those were not part weird. of the original terms and conditions. Weird, and you made it. You I know. It I make it weird. <laughs> but in this case, my whole my whole thing to you was was like if we're going to get married, I have to come first. Because you come first to me. That was the that was <coughs> what you had said to me. And I didn't understand it at 20, how old was I? 24, 25? Well, let's, because I was let's, like, but I live with you and I love you and blah, blah, blah. Let's do the math. You were 25 and I was 26 when we got married. Was I? Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Because it was, it was past January in 2008. But I had some, and I don't know if maybe other women go through this. I had some like weird... It wasn't weird, but I had an attachment to my parents. Then I guess I didn't want to... I guess to, most people do. Well, I would assume most people do. Not not all people, but um, I had this... I, I guess, you know what it was? My parents were still on this pedestal for me. Um, you don't share wives, cars, tools, or guns. Full stop. <laughs> True. Um, that right there, words to live by. <laughs> I um I guess because my parents were still Hold on one second. Didn't want to blow the audience's ears out. <laughs> Crazy. Still getting over my cold. Um my parents were still on a pedestal for me. And you weren't quite there yet. When we first got together, we won't go down this road very long because this isn't a well maybe it is a boundary, I don't know. I <laughs> I did everything I could to get you to break up with me. Oh god, did you ever? <laughs> Well, we, not everything. I didn't do everything. I didn't cheat on you or anything like that. She wanted mainly it to be I was my just fault. a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe mainly I was just a bitch. Um, which I don't know. Anyway, I was stupid and young and dumb. This was the, this was an extension of the if you love something, you let it go and it'll come back to you. This was I love him, so I'm going to act like I hate him and make him break up with me. And if he sticks around through all this, he's freaking crazy. Boy, he loves I, me. Well, there was a lot that went into the whole game that I was playing of maybe he'll break up with me kind of thing. You're so lucky that I care. I liked you as much as I did because every girl that pulled that crap with me prior to you was like instant ejection. That boundary was set. Yes. But I jumped it. I allowed you a little further in. <laughs> you allowed it? To be fair, it wasn't like from the first time I met you, you were just insufferable to me. It was, no, I wasn't. You you waited until I think you waited until about the time I proposed to you, and at that point, no, it was about six months in because I remember going to the beach with our family, and my family, and I don't know. I, anyway, I you wanted were, you to break up. You with were me. dumb. I was dumb. You were dumb. I was so dumb. But I'm glad I'm not dumb anymore. That was, I was only 21 years old at the time. 21 year olds are dumb. 21 year olds are dumb. But, okay, so anyway, I don't know where I was going with that, but back to having my parents on a pedestal and whatever, we either, we had, we were just about to get married or we had just gotten married because I remember we lived in um, our first apartment and you, you said those exact words to me, either I come first or I have to come first in this relationship. 
And it, that was, I think, the first time in my life that I have actually, like, retrospectively looked at myself and was like, what does he mean? Oh, my gosh. I'm really doing that. I and, challenged her in a lot of ways. <laughs> and is that is that about the time, though, that I started to move away from being mom and daddy's little girl to being Phil's wife? I would say it was about that time. I remember there was a short period of time where you started going through, uh, you know, counseling. I think it was in Hammond, actually. And I know that was one of the oh. things. I know that was one of the things I got brought up during that was, you know, like why, why do, why are your, why is your family here, and yet the man that you were engaged to or married to, I don't recall the time, the time timetable. Why is the man you're married to here, and your family's here? Yeah. And I know that was something that came up. It was it was probably one of our bigger <coughs> fights. Yeah. But again, to me, it was and it was like I told you then. I'm like, I'm not saying you're not their daughter and their sister anymore. I'm just saying that like, you you you. Trying to think of my words here. It wasn't that you were asking me to like put you first, but to my from my point of view, by entering into a marriage, that's what it was. You were going to be first. You were always going to be first. Like you, your needs and wants were going to come ahead of my needs and wants. Yeah. And now two of y'all's, two of y'all come ahead of my needs and wants. And like, and Maybe that's, it was just really hard for me because I've always taken care of, of everyone else. And I don't, this is not like a everybody get your violin out for Gillian kind of moment. But I still struggle with this, even with like your sister. Because your sister invited me to go on two girls trips this summer and being included in every single aspect of it has been weird to me because it, to me, it says somebody actually cares about Gillian's input. And now I'm talking in third person, but I've always taken care of everyone else. And then I had this lug of a guy come in and he wanted to take care of me. And I was like, whoa, this is weird. This is, you can't take care of me. I take care of myself and then I'll take care of you because I take care of people. I don't know. Maybe it was that. I'm just weird like that. Yeah. It has been weird. It has been hard for me to accept, um, to accept help from others. It's always hard for me to do that. And to be fair, like you, you also ex expressed in our marriage that like you still want to maintain a lot of your independence. Mm -hmm. you, you don't. You don't want to be micromanaged. You want to be able to kind of like right, you know, handle your own stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I, I was ecstatic with that because I told you years ago, I'm like, the last thing I'm looking to marry is a dependent. I don't want a wife that I have to like, you know, take care of basic adult functionalities for. Like you should, I should be able to trust you. I should be able to trust you and say, hey, babe, can you handle this? And if you say yes, I should be able to turn my back and walk away and never think about it again, knowing it got done. Because yeah, you've always said that. Yeah, but for and it works the opposite direction too, though, because you have to have the expectation that if you ask me to take care of something, it's going to get done. Because it all comes back to like the two of us are both working from both directions to try to take care of the family and the family's mm -hmm. priorities. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I mean, I would, I would say this whole conversation about boundaries is also really, it's also a discussion about expectations and standards and like yeah. it, it really is just about defining the relationship and saying that in order for me to commit to this relationship it there are certain things that have to happen and have to be done a certain way and I don't think that that should ever be an ugly conversation to have I think a lot of people take I think I think at some point like something I've heard a lot growing up is this idea of, well, I'm perfect the way I am, take me as I am. And I think that's just bull crap. 100%. I don't do that. Huh? I don't do that. You don't? I don't think I'm perfect in every way. Well, you don't, but a lot of, uh, you hear that a lot from society. Mm. Is this idea that, like, well, if anybody puts expectations on you, they're wrong. You're, you, you, they have no right to put expectations on you. But that whole thing about a relationship being a non compulsory thing, it's like, if you do not acquiesce to the standards and the demands I'm trying to place upon this relationship, I'm free to leave. Mm -hmm. So that's all I ever tell people is I'm like, when we talk about setting boundaries in relationships, all we're really doing is setting the terms by which I'm willing to engage in this relationship. And if you're not willing to accept those boundaries or those terms or those standards or that code of conduct or that whatever, 
that's fine. It just means I'm not going to be in the relationship. And it works. It has to work both ways. Yeah. Like in order for me to be your husband, there are certain things you expect of me. And it doesn't matter to me if like anybody else thinks that's right or wrong. Those were your condi- those were your boundaries. And I'm going to respect them because I care about you. But if I don't respect them, then you're out of here. Yeah. So that's all I'm saying. I mean, I, I, I think I think that a ba- I think that a relationship without boundaries is always going to wind up being an extraordinarily toxic one, a very unproductive one. Because I think that a relationship, any relationship, like you said earlier, like whether we're talking about family, spouses, your doctor, your neighbors, your whatever, mm-hmm. every relationship has to have boundaries. Yeah, there has to be a point at which. Like you define what that relationship is or is not willing to tolerate. Because if you don't, then by default, you're willing to tolerate anything. And tolerating anything leaves you, you know, subject to the whims of the other person in that relationship. And I hate to say it, but nine times out of ten, that's going to mean you get taken advantage of. Yeah. And even the nicest person will still take advantage of someone without boundaries. The the nicest person is still going to take that which is available because that is just human nature. Mm -hmm. So at a certain, Mm -hmm. at a certain point, I don't want to say to avoid being a pushover, but to avoid being taken advantage of. And that's always, I wouldn't, well, uh, in, in, I'm, I'm thinking of two different relationships I've been in, not like boyfriend, girlfriend, but friendships. I was always the pushover. Mm -hmm. And so I always jumped when they said jump, or I always jumped when they said I need, or I didn't do this. And they didn't necessarily ask, but if I would do it, but I always... People pleasing. Yeah. Again, I'm a people pleaser. I am not going... I'm not a people pleaser anymore. I guess I just really don't care. Like, if you want it done, you do it. I'm not jumping. Because... And this is what I've said to some people that have asked about this relationship this person was always quick to say jump Mm -hmm. and Gillian was always quick to jump. Yep. But when I said, I need you to jump, that person was like me. I don't jump. (laughs) Yeah. And And, and thank God I was in the place that I was in, you know, thank God I've like transitioned into this new person mindset mindset. Because that was an expectation of mine. I'm giving you. I'm jumping. Why aren't? You, why can't you jump for me? And that then that goes back to the. I'm. I'm just as deserving for people to jump for me as you are for people to jump for you. And then it turned out that there were people in your life who, the minute I wouldn't even say the minute you asked them to jump, but the minute you like green lighted them because they were already on the sidelines, hopping up and down, saying, "Put me in, coach. Put me in." Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and they were like, I'll jump for you because you've jumped for me in the past and, and I'll jump for you now. And yeah, it's just been night and day. It's been weird. And it's taking me some time. I told that to your sister. I was like, you just got to bear with me. I jump for a lot of people, but I don't have a lot of people that jump for me. And so it's weird when people are jumping for me. <laughs> yeah. You know, the other thing I was thinking about, because we, we have to wrap this up here in a minute because I know you have things to do. That's why we started the podcast a half hour early. Yeah, I got I to gotta get out of here. But... um I thought to myself, like, looking back at your personality over, like you said, 20 years together and realizing that you've always been a people pleaser and you've always had trouble setting boundaries, do you think maybe that's part of the reason why I have always kind of, like, been hyper-independent and, like, taking care of things by myself and not asked for your help with a lot of things? Because to me it was like she's constantly going in 50 directions for everybody else. I'm not putting one more demand upon her. That's a question you have to answer. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's, uh, that's the question I am rattling around in my head right now. So, so you do things to, you, you're jumping for me because people don't jump for me. That's what I'm wondering. Because like, uh, like I said, well, but it's like I said, like I've always, I've, I've always, hang on. I've always, you're not included in that. People don't jump for me. You've always jumped for me. I know. But like I said, sometimes me jumping for you is she's already given everything she's got to everybody else. There's nothing left to give. It wasn't my intention. It's just, it's an observation. Like I'm thinking to myself, because like, I don't, I don't know. Sky here. You, you know me though. Like I don't all, I don't always, (coughs) I don't always think through like 
super, super deep, like the reason I'm doing something, if that makes sense. Like to me, it's just like, okay, this feels like the right thing to do, or I'm, I'm reading the room and I'm trying to work with the energy in here and I just go with it. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time questioning my decisions. And I'm wondering to myself if that's why for all these years, I've kind of held back from asking you for help. Cause like we still get into it every now and, now and then now, because you'll be like, why didn't you ask for my help? And I was like, cause I had it. We almost almost weekly on Sundays when you're doing chores around the house or something, yeah. Yeah, never thought of it much. I just thought to, I always just thought to myself, I'm like, well, if she wanted to help, she could come over and help, and if she doesn't want to, then it's probably because she's exhausted and just needs to chill for right for a bit. I do, I do, I do go through that. I feel like I get so emotionally spent, and my well is so dry that I don't have anything left to give. And that's one of the reasons why I have given up on relationships and set boundaries is because <laughs> my family doesn't deserve mom to have a dry well. I need to come home with something left to give. And it's one of the reasons why I stopped working in nonprofits and started working as a teacher where I would have the time to veg and I would have weekends and nights, ugh, I stuttered, weekends and nights and summers and holidays and all of those times to recharge. And that has made a world of difference. But then I also, in that time period, have, have cut off relationships that just as equally, if not more, drain my well quicker and drier so that I have nothing left to give at the end of the day. And that is actually part of the reason why I've been so so quick to hold certain people at arm's length ever since you've known me. Because my point of view is like when I come when I come home, when y'all come home from you know, from work and school, y'all do not deserve to have a husband and a father who's you know, just just like has all these other things injecting toxic toxic energy into his life. Like my point of view is that my life stopped being all mine to live and to do the moment I got married. My life is supposed to be to enrich yours. The minute we had her, I'm, again, now I have two things that come ahead of me. So whether I want a relationship or not with another person, friend or whatever, if that relationship is harmful to my family, or even if it's harmful to me, if it takes from me so I have less to give to y'all, it's not a relationship that I can have. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's a it's question of priority. And I'm never going to prioritize the toxic relationship that takes from me more than I prioritize the energy I could maintain to give to my family. Yeah. But we do have to wrap this up. You I know. I've got to get going. You told me 45 minutes show. It's We're 50, 53 minutes right now. I know. Okay. Well, it was a good episode. It. it was a good episode. I think it was. <clears throat> so anyway, well, thank you guys. Um, I'm glad we did announcements at the beginning, but thanks for joining us today. And, um, you know, yada, yada, yada. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> we'll see you next week. I think next week we'll, we'll let you know. Out. We'll let you know. It's always a case-by-case, week-by-week basis. But thanks for joining us so early this morning. Certainly appreciate it. And we'll see you all later. Have a good rest of your day. Get some coffee and get a nap. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.